And welcome in Late Kick on the air. Happy to have you with us. Jam-packed show as always. Trying to fit it in there. And here we go. We are loaded tonight. Make sure right off the top you are subscribed to the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel, which if you're watching is where you're at right now. If you're listening, thank you for subscribing to the podcast. And if you haven't, do that as well. We got content that sometimes doesn't go there that's here. We got content here that doesn't go there. So make sure you're subscribed everywhere. We are loaded tonight and we will waste no time. So let's dive right in. National Signing Day, obviously, where we kick it off. We've got so much to talk about. Here's what I'm not going to do because I see it all the time and I drown in numbers when people throw too many numbers at me. And so the numbers are the numbers. we got to make them relatable. What do they mean? So I could throw out all these different stats that tell you how historic Alabama's signing class is. It's the highest rated class of all time. It's the highest player rating on average in the entire country. But that, to you, I don't really think drives the point home as much as the stat I'm about to give you. So I'm perusing the Alabama message board, BamaOnline.com, really good site for Alabama fans, and the message board over there, I think it's the round table. I saw this stat, so I can't take credit for it, although it is public knowledge. Let me pull up my trusty notebook pad here. Here's all you really need to know about how dominant this class was. The Alabama average player rating, take all their commitments, the average player rating is 95. There are only 110 players in America rated 95 or higher. Their average signee is rated 95. So now I'm putting the trusty notebook pad down because I really don't think I need to read all the other numbers. That, that's out of this world. That is, um, you know, video game type stuff. That's cheat code type stuff. You could go through their class and I could pick out like 15 different guys that would be the absolute crown jewel of many other signing classes. And so I think obviously noteworthy is the wide receiver signing class. We're going to talk to Nick Saban about this later in the show. We've got him exclusive with us. And so the wide receivers, I'll save that. You can listen to him. But man, Jojo Earl, out of many other names, is a name that I love in that group. I just think it's insane, you know, what they're doing on the offensive line. There were two offensive linemen rated in the top five in the overall player ratings this year. They were both offensive tackles. J.C. Latham was number one. Tommy Brockermeyer was number two, and Bama got them both. And neither one was from the state of Alabama. So they're an absolute national recruiting machine at this point. And a lot of people have broken down that class. We've got plenty of time to talk about it. It's just a complete and total machine. It's incredible to watch. And talking to some people last night and sort of putting out some feelers leading up to signing day, I think you'd be kind of surprised at some of the folks who may have wanted into that class that they simply didn't have room for. I also think you may be surprised at guys who were in that class that they recruited, but they certainly didn't go into it in full-out knife fight mode. It's like, we'd like for him to commit. If he doesn't commit, that's not the end of the world. We have other options there. And that would probably uh, amaze you if you're just an onlooker. It would depress you maybe if you're a rival fan, but that's what Nick Saban has going at Alabama right now. But outside of the number one class there with Alabama, in no particular order here, just some other things that caught my eye. You know, I went into yesterday already pretty impressed with what Oregon had done. I think right now, like I said on the show, because of the Pac-12 sticker, you know, the Pac-12 logo on the helmet, I think a lot of folks may overlook them. They may overlook Southern Cal. This time last year, you know, we were way down on Southern Cal because they were way down in the rankings. And I'm going to talk about the Trojans in just a second. But as for Oregon, man, like they're sitting there at number six overall. They went, I think they went into the day number six yesterday. They did nothing to disappoint. They landed Avante Dickerson. And so they're at number six. But I want you to think about this. So it's not just where the class is rated. Someone's going to be number six every year and five and seven. So what you need at Oregon, I think, is you need bona fide star quarterback play. And I think a lot of folks, when I say that, they think to themselves, what what about Marcus Mariota? Yes, but that's in another generation. That was another coaching staff. So then in this world, in this coaching staff with Mario Cristobal in there, then the next thing that comes to people's minds is, well, we, we recently had Justin Herbert here. That's true. But think about the Herbert... Oregon version versus the Herbert NFL version. When he was at Oregon, he was a good player. He was a very good player. But it was always, you're looking at a mock draft, you see Justin Herbert in the top five, and it's much more on projection and tools than proven college production. They haven't had a guy recently who's done it there. And that's where Ty Thompson enters the equation. That's a guy who is a high four-star quarterback out of Arizona. And I've talked to some people who Hey, they would easily rate him five stars. Like they think he may be the most underrated player in the class, especially at a premier position. And so the reason I bring him up is because when you look at all the other supporting cast members that they're bringing in, they're doing a really good job. They go coast to coast. They have to. There is virtually no in-state talent any given year in the state of Oregon. You certainly can't do there what Mac Brown did at North Carolina and just 
hang out in your backyard all day and, and just kind of yell over your fence, hey, you want to come play here? Because it works in North Carolina. That was a loaded in-state class this year. But as for Oregon, they go all over the place. And so they go to Arizona. They get Ty Thompson. If he comes in and he is their version of what Deshaun Watson did to Clemson, if he's their version of what uh, Tua ended up doing at Alabama, I mean revolutionizing the quarterback position, You've seen what's happened at those places since then. It's a conveyor belt of elite wide receiver talent. Think about right now, for instance, an Xavier Worthy who comes from the West Coast and of all places ends up at Michigan, but leaves the West Coast is the theme I want to talk about there. If they can keep elite perimeter skill West Coast talent on the West Coast and make Oregon the destination, they become a national championship contender. That's absolutely going to happen. It's going to be predicated on whether Ty Thompson lives up to the billing. If he does, this was a big day for Oregon because this isn't the first elite class they've had. Like They're stacking classes on top of each other. So that's a program to be excited about. It's a really good thing for the Pac-12 and probably even a good thing for Oregon that Southern Cal ended up rated as high as they were because that's a program I think a lot of us have had serious questions about. I mean, after last year, they finished as low as they did and it wasn't because a coaching staff got fired. Like Clay Helton has been the head coach here the whole time. Well, they brought in, you know, the quarterback position. They got guys like Miller Moss. But the really important part here is the number one player overall in the country was Corey Foreman. And they kept him home. And that was a guy who was linked at any given time to Clemson. He had been committed to him previously, Georgia, LSU. It looked like that was going to be another case of an elite West Coast guy leaving the West Coast. Well, he ends up staying home. And so they got a couple of quarterbacks. I mentioned Moss, Jackson Dart. They've got him in there. But They kept a lot of guys home. They are a top 10 class. Very good thing. So Pac-12 football, not dead. Not dead quite yet. But let me talk about Michigan. So I said Xavier Worthy's name a second ago. Xavier Worthy is one of three players I'm extremely excited about with Michigan. You got to always phrase this and frame it against the backdrop of where the program's at right now. Xavier Worthy is an elite wide receiver, high four-star receiver. You can choose whether you want to call him very good or elite. He's got burner speed. That's what they've lacked, to be honest with you, on both sides of the ball. But they've lacked it at the perimeter skill positions, and they've lacked elite presence at running back and quarterback to go along with all that. Obviously, it it all works off the quarterback position. So J.J. McCarthy could be one of the very most important players in this entire recruiting cycle. He is a five-star quarterback coming to Michigan. And unlike the Shea Patterson experimentation, I actually think this one's going to play out very well for Michigan. Let's hope it does. So let's assume it does for a second. J.J. McCarthy comes in. He's got all the intangibles you want. He's obviously got the physical traits you want. And he ends up being the guy that takes the job as a true freshman. Let's just say for a second he takes the job. Well, Josh Gaddis certainly hopes that's the way it plays out because that would mean Josh Gaddis and Michigan hit a home run on the offensive recruiting side. But also he's got his guy now. And he's got the guy that other players like Edwards and like Xavier Worthy came to Michigan to play with. And then all of a sudden, you look at some of the speed they're infusing outside of just the guys I just mentioned offensively. It could be that, you know, let's say it's November of 2021. You look back a year prior, and the biggest question was, uh, is Jim Harbaugh going to be here next year? Well, it could be that in November of this year, 2021, a year later, you're looking forward and you're saying, man, who would have thought that not only are we not talking about job security, we're talking about Michigan being a fringe Big 10 title contender. And if if nothing else, we're looking forward to 2022 and saying, boy, this team, they're good already. They're just scratching the surface. That's the kind of stuff that you have to put in motion. And to put it in motion, you have to do it yesterday, National Signing Day. That's when you have to do it. And they took really good steps in doing that. They finished in the top 10. That's a really good thing. It's a really good start for Michigan because it wasn't just that they went out and signed a lot of like safeties and linebackers and just loaded their class, but they didn't address needs. They addressed a ton of needs. So, you know, I can still remain somewhat skeptical, but also be extremely hopeful because that's where I am with Michigan at the present moment. And we'll stay in the Big Ten, just kind of skipping around here. Again, I'm not going in any particular order. Ohio State, I mean, obviously in the spring, it looked like they were going to not only be the number one class in this cycle, but they may be the one we were talking about contending for having the number one class of all time. And only by that metric could you label this class a disappointment because it is an incredible class. They're finishing number two. Uh, They are certainly by far the number one class in the Big Ten and, and have been for quite a while now. So there are difference makers up and down this entire commit list. But I'll tell you what stood out to me really more than any one player. And trust me, I could spend an hour individualing these players. 
We had Ryan Day on the show, and he was nice enough to join us for a few minutes yesterday. That entire replay, by the way, is on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. So in its entirety, you can watch that. So I asked Ryan Day the same question I've asked a few coaches. How did the differences in the way you had to go about recruiting in this cycle with Zoom instead of in-person communication and whatnot, how did that impact the class? So he took it a different direction than I thought. Number one, he took it the direction of, I think it probably in ways made this class closer than ever, even though you would think the distance would create more separation. He said it had the opposite impact. But then Ryan Day also said, you know, we've learned at Ohio State that you got to be, and in this particular era with Zoom and whatnot, you have to be as brutally honest as you can with guys. It's kind of the Nick Saban approach. We've heard him talk about this several times. It's no coincidence all these elite coaches at elite programs keep saying the same thing. Ryan Day said, we cannot rely on just talking guys into coming to our program anymore. It's not the way it works. Now, I'm going to paraphrase, but here's what he's actually saying. We're too loaded. Our roster is too loaded. We can't just talk kids into coming here. In other words, you can't just dangle a piece of candy in front of them and then they get here and they see how loaded the receiver room is or loaded the linebacker room is and expect them to just say, oh, okay, you know, I'll, I'll sit for two or three years if I have to. That's not the way it works. You've got to be honest with them up front. You've got to tell them you're going to have to fight your you-know-what off every day in practice to ever even get on the field here. And if that doesn't appeal to you, just like we talked about with Alabama last week, if that doesn't appeal to you, then Ohio State may not be the place for you. And he's right. He said you got to be authentic with them, but you got to present the actual picture and then let them decide if that's a picture they want to be a part of. And if they don't, that's fine. Ohio State's not for everybody. And more and more, the filter is becoming more refined as to what makes it through in terms of a recruiting prospect. But the ones that are left... Because, see, if you take that process, you're going to miss out on some really good players. But what the process is designed to do is make sure that all the players that make it through that filter, that you very rarely miss on them. And that's why you don't really see a whole lot of off-field issues anymore at, at Alabama. You're not really seeing a ton of off-field issues at Ohio State. Doesn't that fly in the face of what conventional wisdom used to be? I remember... Back in the day, back in the 90s, when I was uh, I was kind of growing up and I would listen to the older folks talk, they would say, it was kind of a joke, no one would ever say this publicly, but everyone would joke, you know that you're getting close to having a really good program when you start seeing some players get arrested, okay? Now, it was very crude, but it was a, basically a way to say, you've got to have a certain caliber of athlete on campus, and with that caliber athlete, it was just assumed you have to take the risk off the field. They're going to get in some trouble, but they're also going to win for you. Do you notice how that's been turned on its ear? Essentially, what major programs have done, Clemson, is the same way. They don't have a ton of off-field issues. I'm not saying there's never a blip on the radar screen, but you used to think that you had to pay a price to have high-caliber athletes on campus. Well, what has been discovered is, uh, number one, I think with the proliferation of social media, players at a young age are now aware they can't make a false move. Everything is seen. So I think guys from the time they're 12 years old understand that. But there are also enough elite athletes out there that are not bad character guys to where it's possible to load a class up like Ohio State did yesterday and not have to stay up late at night checking your phone every five minutes if you're Ryan Day just waiting for that text. Oh, who do we got to go bail out? Oh, who are we going to have to suspend for two weeks? That's not the way they operate. And if you stop to think about that for a second, that in and of itself is really incredible. So those are some of the programs that I was really impressed with. Obviously, I didn't hit them all. I could go 30 minutes on North Carolina right now. Look at there. If you want to have some fun, go pull up 247sports.com. In fact, I'm going to do it for you right now as we wrap this up. Go to 247sports.com. Go to the team recruiting rankings. And then go to North Carolina's class. And ask yourself, as I was talking about Oregon having to go out of state constantly for their players, and I mentioned North Carolina, this is the total opposite. I'm going to read you North Carolina's highest rated commits. I'm just going to go in order, and I'm going to read their location. Okay? So let's just start down the list. I'm not going to mention names. North Carolina, North Carolina, North Carolina, North Carolina. North Carolina, North Carolina, North Carolina, North Carolina, South Carolina, South Carolina, North Carolina, North Carolina, North Carolina, North Carolina. Tennessee, North Carolina, Florida, North Carolina, Virginia. Did you notice a theme? I think there was one there. I can't quite put my finger on it, but I noticed a theme. So the point is there are many different ways to skin the old cat in recruiting because Oregon and North Carolina both finished top 15, and that's about all that their classes have in common. 
And we roll on here. So I did not mention Miami there, only because I wanted to talk about Miami on their own. So I'll give you a nice little clean end cut here, Colin. Miami recruiting. What do you think? Miami football. What do you think right now? Well, pretty good program. You know, they flirted inside the top 10 for a little while this past season. Manny Diaz now a couple of years into the tenure. They are number 12 in the overall 24-7 sports team recruiting rankings for this life cycle. It's not not bad at all. They kept some big-time players at home in South Florida. Leonard Taylor, five-star defensive lineman. Uh, James Williams, big safety, jumbo defensive back. They kept those guys in South Florida. It's a really good deal. So, um do you think of them as elite? No, you don't. I don't either. Their fans don't right now. Do you think of them as terrible? No, I don't. You don't. Their fans don't. It's just kind of somewhere in between, probably closer to elite than terrible, but they're in that good to pretty good range. I want you to think about the future. Now, how I know things are going to evolve is because they always have. I mean, in sports, in life, like nothing ever just stays the same. It's always evolving. I want you to think about your experience as a fan. Your experience as a fan on National Signing Day alone 10 years ago versus 10 years later yesterday. 10 years ago, if you're die hard, if you're like me, then you circled that date and you, you were working, by Christmas time, you were working on a way to find out how to make the first Wednesday in February your Christmas. How are you going to get off work? How are you going to make sure that you don't have all kinds of responsibilities during the day? 10 years later... National Signing Day, February, what was it, February 3rd, 2021, some of you told me, hey, I'm more interested in the transfer portal at this point than I am National Signing Day. I've listened to you, by the way. I have listened. Uh, so just stay tuned on that, both from a company standpoint and a late kick standpoint. Just stay tuned. The transfer portal, you are right to be interested in it. It's not going anywhere. In fact, it's the impetus for what I'm talking about here with Miami. So Miami finished 12th yesterday. There is no bright red beacon, blinking light on this program that says, uh-oh, they're right there. They're one step away from being a perennial national title contender. I just want you to think about the evolution. So as I told you, even your fan experience, even your viewership and, and internet surfing experience has changed when it comes to college football over the last decade. Think about the next five years. I'm telling you, Miami could be on the border of benefiting greater than any program in America from what 2021 through 2025 has to offer in the sport of college football. Two things are in motion right now. The first already in motion is the transfer portal. The transfer portal, we've seen very recently a program like the University of Florida take advantage of it by bringing Eric Gilbert in. I mean, just a year ago around this time, we were talking about Eric Gilbert. Is it going to be Georgia? Is it going to be Alabama? Oh my, he swerved everyone. He went to LSU. Well, my point there is none of those programs are named Florida. And yet a year later, that's where he's at. That's how the transfer portal is going to be from now on. Well, I want you to think about how popular South Florida is as a recruiting destination. I mean, one of the big storylines for Miami has been, can they keep their guys home? And they did it to a certain extent this year, but for every Leonard Taylor, there was a Dallas Turner. You know, for every James Williams, there was a Ja'Cory Brooks. Like, they got guys leaving the state still, and they always will. You cannot lock down Florida. So how in the world am I saying that this is going to heavily benefit Miami? Well, here's what's going to happen. A lot more guys, as they leave home from South Florida and they go off to Arizona or California or Alabama or Clemson, like wherever, is when they go away, more and more guys are going to look for the escape route after year one. That's just the way it's going to be. A lot of guys are going to get homesick. They're not going to like their playing situation. They're not going to like the depth chart. Maybe they just don't fit in culturally on campus. Well, the fallback option is going to be more times than not something closer to home. That's what you're going to want. Well, guess where home is? South Florida for all those kids. They're going to be a ton of South Florida kids looking to get out after year one. And if they're looking to get out and home is a factor, proximity to family is a factor, then by default, Miami's sitting there. Because you got the benefit, if you went to American Heritage in Florida and then you went off to Clemson to play your college football and you don't like it after year one, and you're looking to go back home, then all of a sudden, hey, I got the added benefit of having a Power 5 program right in my backyard. It's Miami. They recruited me anyway. I like their staff anyway. I'm going to go play for them. And what I'm telling you is Miami is going to become a program that is in position to do every year what a program like Oklahoma just did. Like Oklahoma has nailed the transfer portal this year. Miami can do it every year, guys. They're going to be able to do it every year. Notice I didn't say that's going to be their complete and total strategy. I said they're going to be able to do it. So you could see Miami's plan as a recruiting power in the future evolve to where they plan on taking mid-sized classes. 
15 to 20 guys any given cycle, and then they leave, instead of one or two spots open, five or six spots open for the transfer portal because they know, without even knowing specific names, they know they're going to be able to leverage it. That's part one. Part two is name, image, and likeness. So take all these things and combine them. We're layering them like a cake, which I've never baked before, but I've seen, them, I've seen it done. So think about name, image, and likeness, and think about all the opportunities that you will have. Now, they know this. They've seen this coming for a while. Being in South Florida, being in Miami, having all the marketing potential and all the name, image, and likeness potential and, and the profitability, just flat out profitability for me as a prospective student athlete. I'm a four-star tight end with potential from Columbus, Georgia, and I'm looking around and Alabama's got a lot to offer me. Uh, and Georgia's got a lot to offer me and, and they're recruiting me and I grew up watching them. But Miami's got a lot to offer me too. They're competitive on the field, but they also add such a bigger total compensation package from my name, image, and likeness perspective if I go down there because there's just bigger market down there. And I don't want to go all the way across the country to LA. And so the next closest thing to LA for me if I'm in Georgia is I could go to South Beach, man. I could go down to Miami and I could be involved in all sorts of things. And I could play for a really storied, tradition-rich football program. I mean, the side of that helmet still means something with that U. So think about all these things layered. No one of these things is going to let them dominate the sport. And I'm not telling you they're going to dominate the sport. I'm telling you if we're going back to the old stock adage and which arrow is pointing up, it's Miami. Miami's already in a recruiting hotbed any given year. Miami's got a nice foundation laid right now. They got a solid coaching staff. They're continuing to tweak it and overhaul it. They just brought in some more big time names. And now you think about the proliferation of the transfer portal by default, how many South Florida guys will be looking to get back close to home any given year that they could benefit from. Compounding that is the name, image, and likeness on the horizon that could greatly benefit kids and attract them to South Florida. And all of a sudden you got Miami that's just kind of always been there. You know, they're kind of sitting in the right place and the right time is finally finding them again. The right time is coming along and the college football world, it's almost like if you think about it from a grand design perspective, if there were a grand design in college football, every one of these designs would be tailored to making Miami a contender. I mean, that's kind of the way it feels. And I'm not saying that's the way it is. That's the way it feels. So if you want some stock advice on top of the ones we already talked about, the more and more I think about it, the more and more I love where Miami football is positioned. Manny Diaz just as an individual, as a coach, walked in the door at the exact right time. And if they can get stuff figured out right now, they don't have to be elite. Just put yourself in position. Put yourself on the starting line. You know, get yourself in the air. If you're, a, if you're a pilot, and I'm not, so I don't know what I'm talking about right now. But if you think about how easy it is to fly west to east as opposed to east to west, it's easier because you have the jet stream at your back. That's why it takes a lot less time to fly from L.A. to New York than it does New York to L.A., and so that is college football's jet stream. Miami's just got to get the plane off the ground, and the jet stream will end up pushing them. They'll have a nice tailwind. That doesn't mean you can't crash. It just means it's a lot easier. You're not going against the grain. You don't have a million forces working against you like it has seemed in the past, maybe externally, maybe internally. So Miami football, bye, bye, bye. All right, moving on. Uh, so National Signing Day in the books. Nick Saban was nice enough to join us yesterday, coming off the heels of, obviously, Alabama's highest-rated class of all time, highest-rated class in the history of the 24-7 sports team recruiting rankings. So it was a banner day, likes of which we've never seen. And so, of course, Nick Saban, in the middle of all of that, said, you know what, I think I need to be on late kick. So here's our conversation with Nick Saban. I recorded this yesterday on National Signing Day. We'll play it here, and I'll talk to you some more on the back end. Alabama head coach Nick Saban joining us now on kind of the heels of what's been around the country, a pretty action-packed signing day for the University of Alabama. It's stellar as always. I thought it was really interesting, Coach. Like you and I talked a few months ago, and at the time it was the beginning of COVID and, you know, camps are out the window, evaluation process is changing. And at the time, you guys, at least as far as we knew, had one verbal commit. Fast forward, the class looks pretty much the same it always does. What was the process like between that point and this point, though? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, we always go through a process of trying to get guys here that fit what we want from a criteria standpoint at each position, whether it's size, speed, character, uh, all those things. And uh, early on last year, you know, sometimes, you know, we go through a process. So sometimes we want to complete that process. And uh, even though we're in on a lot of good players, um, you know, it took a little more time. 
Uh, we were waiting to go out and see spring practice in some cases um, when this all happened last March. And then when we didn't have the opportunity to do that, we just moved forward on you know, the guys that we knew the most about. Um, but we knew quite a bit about lots of players last year. I think this year is going to be a little different challenge because uh, we don't know as much about the players, you know, coming up next year. It's, so, I mean, in a way, are you telling me you kind of have to backload your evaluation process, whereas, you know, you had the front-loaded nature of this one. So you got to find out about guys a little bit later on in the cycle than in a normal year you would? Well, I, I think that if you get too aggressive uh, and you don't know enough about players, whether it's their character, uh, whether it's how big they are, how big they can get, whether it's do they have the physical skills to do the things that you want them to do at their position, that you end up maybe – getting some guys that you find out later on that there are guys that fit your criteria even better, but you can't take them because you're already full. So um, that's why we, we sort of make sure we go through the process and uh, make sure these guys are people who are a good fit for our culture here at Alabama. You guys changed the way that you run the football program a few years ago. Offense is now out of this world, the likes of which we may have never imagined circa Alabama 10 years ago and everyone's looking at the wide receiver talent exiting Tuscaloosa and yet you know we here 24 7 sports like we're fascinated with the Jojo Earls or Christian Leary's of the world but I'm looking at the receiver class you're bringing in and some of the physical traits that these guys have whether it be like a Ja'Cory Brooks or an Aggie A. Hall there are some at least to me some bigger bodied receivers in this class than maybe we've seen on the field the last couple of years and I'm wondering was that a conscious effort in your evaluation or is that just the kind of player that was available this cycle? Well, we always want to recruit the best players that are available in the cycle. And, you know, the, the year that we got Smitty and um, Ruggs and Jerry Judy uh, all in the same class, um, we thought that was, you know, that those guys were all really special. Um, you know, we feel like some of the guys that we got this year could be really special, but it's all going to be about how they develop, you know, in the program here, how they learn, how they grow, how they become consistent performers, take advantage of, you know, the opportunities that they have. But we feel good about them, and I think they have a lot of opportunity because of all the players that we lost as well. So, but it really wasn't a conscious effort to get a different type of player. Um I think receivers are a little bit like basketball teams. You know, you can have a power forward who is a great player. You can have a point guard that's a great player. Uh, you can have a shooting guard that's a great player. They're all a different little different skill set, but they all can impact your team and help your team be successful if they're dominant at their position. So it's not a certain type of guy, but it's, it's, it's a combination of the guys that you get. And I thought we got a really good combination of guys this year. One of the most awesome things I saw from this past year's actual football team on the field was how often you went out of your way to talk about how together and close and knit a group it was. And I mean, how emotional you were once you crossed the finish line with that team in the national championship game. And the way I know it's not coach speak is because I don't always hear you say that. And so in the recruiting world now, this class you guys just put together, you had to do it a different way than you've ever done it before. I had Ryan Day on the show today, and he was talking about how because of the unique way with Zoom and everything that we had to recruit and our players had to recruit other players, this may be the most closely knit recruiting group that I've ever had. I'm kind of curious if you've experienced that. Well, it seems like the guys that are here now, which is all you can judge it on, the 15 guys that came in at mid-semester, um, they seem to be a really together bunch. Um, and I, I think they develop relationships uh, different ways, just like we've all had to develop relationships different ways in this recruiting class. It wasn't as much face-to-face -face as it was on Zoom and virtually. Um, but but I think, you know, players kind of, like I thought it really was an impact on our team this year that when football got sort of taken away in March, April, and May, um, that the communication that the players had on Zoom was even greater than when they were together. And I also think that um, when you take something away from somebody, sometimes they develop a little greater appreciation for what they had uh, and how much they missed football, how much they missed their teammates. So that kind of made them even, you know, sort of more together when they got back together in June. So I think that same thing can happen in recruiting. I'll wrap it up with you here, Coach. I appreciate you joining us. You guys have uh, recently at least made official some staff additions. And just – I won't even go a specific guy, but just overall, how pleased are you, how satisfied are you with the way that this 
latest round of staff departures and additions came about? Well, obviously, the guys that departed were all very good coaches and did a great job for us. Uh, and um, we're always happy to see people get, you know, better opportunities to become head coaches or coordinators or whatever might happen. Um, but I also think that, you know, it gives us an opportunity to add, you know, very talented people to our organization. And I think, you know, in this case, uh, even though we're sorry to see people leave, we're excited about the people that we're able to attract to get here to uh, sort of, you know, help develop our players personally, academically, and athletically. So I'm really pleased with the group. It's Alabama head coach Nick Saban. Coach, it is always an honor to talk to you. Awesome as always. Have a great day, man. All right. Thank you. That's the greatest to ever do it. Always a pleasure when Nick Saban joins us. And I also want to tell you, that was right before they got Terry and Arnold. He already knew it. He already knew it. So they have, um, again, to reiterate the stat that I gave you at the beginning of the show, they have an average player rating in this recruiting class of 95. There are 110 players in America with a rating of 95 or higher. And again, Alabama's average player rating at 95. So that was fun. Uh, Hopefully not the last time we talk to Nick Saban before the start of the season. Have some plans. We'll see how things go. I think it's going to be a really fun offseason. I don't like saying that word because we don't believe in it around here, but I'll just give you a little piece of advice, okay? Um, if, you're, if you're a casual college football fan, but you kind of lean more on the side of it saturating your life, and then, of course, if you're a diehard fan, this is not a place that you want to walk away from and then come back in August. You can do that, and certainly we'll have a lot of folks who do that, but what I'm telling you is we're not just going to pass the time, especially with late kick. We're not just going to pass the time in the offseason. Like, I've been asking you guys for a while, what are you interested in? The reason I keep asking you, and I'm asking you again now, joshpate706 at gmail.com, at late kick Josh on Twitter. I talk with you guys constantly because I want to stack the show and format the show for you. And the off season, excuse me, off season, it's being formatted for you right now. And there are a lot of really unique ideas that I think we're in a position to execute that is really going to appeal to our audience. It is curated by our audience. And so it's foolproof. I know it'll work because you guys came up with the ideas, but we're going to take some of the access we have we're going to take some of the intel that we have access to, and we're also going to take, uh, well, the, the company credit card, essentially, and we're going to make some stuff happen. So we're in a position to do it. Uh, we want to do it. And listen, we got some time to do it, so it's going to be a really fun offseason. Remember, follow me on Twitter again, at Late Kick Josh. A lot of stuff happens that we're not live on the air for, and a lot of back and forth happens there, too. So be sure you're doing that. Also, anyone looking to book a Zoom session, want to get in sports media, want to start your own podcast or YouTube channel for anything, sports or otherwise, hit me up. The email, joshpate706 at gmail.com. And again, on Twitter, at Late Kick Josh. And subscribe to the Late Kick Podcast while you're at it. We want to get 2,000 five-star reviews by the end of spring practice. Hashtag goal season. So for Director Colin, for Producer Jordan on the podcast side of things, I'm Josh Pate. Have a great rest of your evening. It's been a fun-filled week, and I'm sure we have plenty more to come. Have a great rest of your night. God bless. Mm-hmm.